Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Jack Sifri and I will be sharing with you some useful and interesting content on 5G design and analysis. So let's start. Here is the agenda. First, I will give a brief introduction followed by a comprehensive discussion on EM circuit co-simulation in ADS, which is very important and it is used widely in this presentation. Next, I will share with you design techniques and six types of analysis I have performed on a 5G transmit chain using EM circuit co-simulation. These six analyses are listed here on this page. Okay, let me start by asking why millimeter wave bands for 5G? You see, 5G is expected to offer extremely fast rates with extremely low latency. Now, to achieve these tough specifications, the operating frequency must be in a region where high bandwidth and high speed is available. This means we must move toward the millimeter wave band. But the millimeter wave band had always been viewed unsuitable for mobile communications, mainly because of high loss and propagation issues. However, the research has shown that these propagation issues can be addressed and overcome if we use phased arrays and beam steering antennas. So a phased array antenna is basically composed of multiple radiating elements. Each element is connected to a phase shifter, which forms the beam that steers the antenna. So now with these phased array antennas, we can enter the millimeter wave spectrum and achieve that high bandwidth and high speeds that 5G promises. So in this presentation, I will use a 5G 28 GHz phased array transmit chain with 4x4 beam steered patch antenna. And I will introduce to you the electromagnetic EM circuit co-simulation technique, which I have used in my analysis to present important finding I have uncovered during the design phase. I will also present to you on other interesting and important topics, such as X-parameter models and a powerful design methodology to help you reduce the variability in your designs and produce robust 5G circuits with consistent output results and high yield. Okay, let's begin. See, 5G brings lots of challenges, especially when combining high-frequency circuit design elements of multiple manufacturing technologies with different model abstractions, including physical EM models. All of these must be combined together and co-simulated simultaneously. So here, I introduce to you the EM circuit excitation and co-simulation process in ADS, which allows us to combine and co-simulate the transmit chain with all of its components, along with the antenna EM simulation, and deliver accurate simulation results of the whole system with all of its components, including the antenna. So what you see on this slide here is the transceiver components, the power amplifiers, small signal amplifiers, phase shifter, filters, dividers, other circuits on the schematic page. And they are all designed at the circuit level using foundry design kits models, or they are represented by their S-parameter models or nonlinear X-parameter models or EM models. Now the output of such circuit simulation on the transmit chain drives and excites the physical antenna structure that's being simultaneously co-simulated with momentum planar EM solver or with a full 3D FEM solver in ADS. Now the output response at the far right comprises the complete EM circuit co-simulated results produced by capturing the excitation from the transmitter module and applying it directly to the antenna all simulated simultaneously. So you can see on the far right of this page, 
all of the simulated states of the phase shifter that were simulated at the circuit level and have been exported to the output far field results. The output beam and its side lobes and nulls can then be displayed and you can steer it. It can be steered for any selected phase shifter state. Therefore, you can see it contains the complete and accurate EM circuit co-simulation and analysis results. So let me now share with you a pre-recorded demo I have prepared for you to illustrate to you this valuable simulation and analysis method and show you how it works. Hello everyone. In this short video, I would like to illustrate to you how to perform EM circuit excitation in RF Pro. Here I have a 5G beam steering transmit chain that is interfacing a 4x4 patch antenna. The phase shifter angle in the transmit chain is swept by increments of 31 degrees using circuit simulation. And this swept results from the transmitter drive the antenna, which is EM simulated in RF Pro. Let me show you how to do this. First, we start with the antenna layout and launch RF Pro from the tools menu. In RF Pro, I select to simulate my structure with Momentum Microwave Simulator. In the Frequency Plans tab, I input the simulation frequencies. Notice that you must include the frequencies that will be used in the far field view and we must save them in the memory using the Field Storage tab. Once the simulation is completed, RF Pro generates a sub-circuit EM model to use in ADS as shown here. If you push into the symbol, you can see the generated sub-circuit with the antenna EM model. So now, let's simulate the transmit chain in ADS interfacing the antenna EM model. You can see the simulation runs and the phase angle of the phase shifter is swept by increments of 31 degrees. The simulation results here will be saved in a data set that can be accessed in RF Pro to view the overall circuit EM co-simulation far field views. So now in the RF Pro page, select far field, select type of excitation to be circuit excitation, and browse and select the ADS simulation data set that contains the circuit simulation of the transmit chain with swept phase angle. Next, select the frequency of choice. Here it is 28 gigahertz. And here we go. We see the antenna beam that can be steered with the phase shifter swept angle with increments of 31 degrees. Similarly, we can view the antenna current density that is generated from various swept angles in the phase shifter, as shown here. And, of course, you can plot the antenna port's S parameters in the RF Pro results panel as shown here. And this is it. This is how you perform EM circuit excitation in RF Pro. Thank you for watching. Okay, I hope you have found the demo useful. Now here on the left side of this slide, Notice that I can also use realistic 5G modulated source at the input of my transmit chain. Circuit envelope simulator is a hybrid time and frequency domain simulator that can handle and simulate this type of modulated source efficiently and captures memory effects of the amplifier and its effect on EVM, constellation, and other measures. And it produces also a more realistic circuit excitation at the antenna ports when you do the EM circuit co-simulation. And that gives you true EM circuit co-simulation with memory effects. So please note, we are not abstracting some static models to co-simulate here. We are actually co-simulating the real circuits at their device level with memory effects. 
So in summary, the circuit EM co-simulation method in ADS delivers accurate simulation results of the whole system with all its components, including the antenna. You can plot the near field and far field, and you can steer the beam with various phase shift angles as shown on the left side. You can extract the antenna parameters as shown in the middle of the page. You can export the far field plots into ADS data display and use it in your data analysis as I will show you in the next section. So now in this new section, I will use the EM circuit co-simulation on various analysis and share with you some interesting and useful findings. Let me start with the effect of the feed networks and line lengths. This slide was extracted from Dr. Gabriel Rebe's RFIC Symposium Plenary Talk. Notice the system on the top left uses more ICs and equal line lengths between the output of the ICs and the antenna patches. And that requires no calibration. But the system implementation on the top right side uses less chips and unequal length lines between the output of the ICs and the antenna patches. These longer length lines result in higher loss and require calibration to make the system work. And this is what I will be showing you on the next few slides. So here is my system interfacing the antenna patches and notice it has no feed lines between the transmitter output and the antenna patches. All 16 connections are identical. And I want to run a simulation on this in order to get a baseline or a reference output profile. And here it is. My beam is centered on the y-axis and the side lobe is 14.3 dB down from the peak and the nulls are about 35 dB down from the peak. This is my clean beam reference. And now I want to introduce and add feed lines at the output of the transmit chain interfacing the antenna. And then I will vary these line lengths to see the effects on my output beam profile. So notice on the left side of the page, I used four different small size line lengths of two, one and a half, point five, and one millimeter long. And watch what happens to my beam profile. It is messed up and requires calibration. The beam has shifted by five degrees and the side lobe and nulls has degraded badly. Side lobe is now 9 dB down and the null is 18.7 dB down. The quality of this beam has degraded badly. Now on the next page, I used longer lines of different lengths, 3, 5, 7 and 9 millimeters. These longer lines have shifted my beam furthermore by 28 degrees. The side lobes and nulls have degraded as well. So you can see that if you are building a prototype 5G system in the lab and your output connections to the antenna are different in lengths, you will get this terrible beam profile. I know at the end there will be a lot of work to calibrate the whole system, but be careful about this during the development phase in the lab. You must be careful on the feed network line lengths. Let us now move to failure analysis and discuss the effect of component failure. Now on this page, I'm listing four types of failures. Catastrophic failure, which is basically when a device blows up and becomes open or short circuit, resulting in an amplifier, for example, with no gain. Parametric failure would be something like when a component, for example, capacitor, operates outside its normal operating limits and it causes failure. Intermittent failure has to do with some poor connection, a bad solder joint, sometimes it connects and it works and other times it opens and doesn't work. Environmental failure has to do with environmental conditions such as vibration or high operating temperature. So I have performed few failure analysis for you and I have some interesting results to share with you.
Let me start with an example of intermittent failure on a solder joint at the input divider of the quad section. When the solder joint is open, the PAs or the whole arms are open and become non-functional. And you can see this in the near field EM plot on the top right of the page. Notice the current density in the second row is very low due to the non-functional four PAs. So if this happened, what kind of output signal will we get? Here it is. The red profile is when all the PAs are working properly. And the blue profile is when the four PAs are open. Notice the main beam and the lobes degrade down equally. The bore side of the main beam and the lobes both drop down in equal magnitude and in the same direction. But look at the lower right part of the slide. The radiated power has dropped from 6.48 watts down to 4.32 watts. One third of the power is lost due to this intermittent failure. Now let me show you a more interesting case. Here I am experimenting on a catastrophic failure case with either one or two PAs open circuited. Let's take a look at the results. Here at the right side we see PA number 2 and PA number 11 are disconnected with a very low current density. Look at the results. The red profile is when all of the PAs are on and functional. All of them are on. The blue profile is when one PA fails, only one PA. And the green profile is when PA number 2 and PA number 11 fail. Two PAs are off. Now, what is very interesting is the side lobe gets higher as the main lobe is lowered. In other words, they move in the opposite directions. This is totally different than what we saw before in the intermittent case with four adjacent PAs off. Here, the main beam lost gain and power, but the side lobes moved in the opposite direction and gained the power. And what is even more interesting is if I turn off PAs 2 and 10 now instead of 2 and 11. Look at the results. They are shown in black color. The side lobes here are even worse than PAs 2 and 11 case. In the green color case, when PA 2 and 11 were off, the side lobe went up by 4.1 dB. But here in the black color case, when PA 2 and 10 are off, the side lobes went up even more by 4.7 dB. So depending on which PAs fail may result in a worse beam profile and higher side lobes. This is why it is worth doing this quick analysis to understand what happens to your system if failure takes place. Also notice at the bottom right corner, with two PAs off, the radiated power results show that we lose almost half of our radiated power in the main beam. But to make things worse, the side lobes go up higher, and they could interfere now with another user's main beam pointing in the same direction. Here's a better way to illustrate this to you. On this slide, we see two users, user 1 and user 2. User 1 main beam shown in red color with all the PAs are on. It points at 0 degrees in the y-axis. Now user 2 main beam shown in blue color with two PAs off due to failure. It's pointing at minus 44 degrees. But notice the high level of user's two side lobe shown in blue color and pointing at zero degrees. This higher level side lobe is due to the PAs, the two PAs failure. And that high level side lobe would interfere with user number one pointing in the same direction at zero degrees. Therefore, this type of analysis is crucial because that higher side lobes do interfere with other users and could degrade the system performance. Now, let us investigate the effect of temperature 
on our system. Here in this analysis, I ran the system simulation with the PAs at 25 degrees and again at 60 degrees. Yes, the PAs could get hot due to their thermal performance and also due to the surrounding temperature rise. Here are the results. We see more than one third of the power is lost due to the rise in temperature. The radiation intensity dropped from 29 to 18 watts per steradian, and the total radiated power shown at the bottom right corner dropped from 6.48 watts to 4.1 watts. So what do designers do to create power amplifiers that are more resistant to temperature change? One common method I'd like to share with you is to use the current mirror active bias network. Here it is. This active bias topology helps compensate for temperature. Here we have the large RF transistor with current I out and another smaller mirror transistor with current I mirror. Now, if you look at the equation shown on the top middle of the page, it describes the change of I out relative to the change in temperature of the mirror device. So we're looking at DI out DT mirror. And we can write this equation with two terms as shown in the red boxed equation. Now, without going into too much detail, the first term in the equation has a negative slope, and it is clearly shown in the graph of VBE versus temperature of a PN junction diode characteristic. You can see the slope is negative. The second term has a positive slope, and that is extracted from the equation in the middle of the page. So what does this mean? It means that the top equation now, di out over dt mirror, ends up with a negative slope, or we can say I out and T mirror are inversely proportional. So in other words, if temperature T mirror goes down, I out will increase. Or another way to state this is, if the small mirror transistor runs cooler than the larger RF transistor, the bias current I out will increase, which can increase the RF gain and that is how this temperature compensation network works. I also would like to mention to you here that ADS has integrated electrothermal simulator, which is an FEM solver that solves the thermal equations and displays temperature profile and also accounts for all the thermal coupling between adjacent devices. Okay, let us now move to another analysis. Here, let us investigate now the effect of varying the PA's PN, out amplitude and phase response. Let's go back to my transmit chain system, but notice here I have replaced the Plextech RFI PA circuit design with its corresponding nonlinear X parameter model. So let me briefly share with you what are X parameter models. Here's a picture of a power amplifier schematic, and underneath it is its generated X parameter model. This model is very accurate and captures all of the nonlinearities. It simulates much faster and is ideal to use it in a trade off analysis and verification, like what, what we're doing here. It also protects your intellectual property. No one can see your circuit design topologies when you share it and it can be generated with any load, not only 50 ohm. Now here, I'm plotting the circuit response in blue versus the model response in red. Notice the results are identical. What I'm showing here is the fundamental frequency, second harmonic and third harmonic in both magnitude and phase, and both model and circuit are identical. And on the right side, I'm showing the load pull results under any load for power added efficiency and delivered power contours, all as a function of swept input power. The slider is shown at the bottom. 
So I went ahead and generated an X parameter model for the PA in my transmit chain. And here is the circuit simulation response versus the model response. They are identical. Next, I have generated several models by tweaking the design and varying its components tolerances in order to get variations in the response as shown here. I ran the EM circuit co-simulation on my transmit chain with the several varying AM to PM PAs response. And again, I noticed the degradation in the side lobe and in the nulls as shown here. Later, I will show more degradation when I discuss the dynamic impedance topic. So this takes me to share with you a unique design technique that would eliminate wide variation in all of your designs and produce consistent and low variability output response with high yield. This design methodology is called design of experiments or DOE. Notice at the bottom of the page, this YouTube video I have created a while back. I encourage you to see it and learn in detail how does this DOE methodology work. It is a 12 minute video and it explains the methodology. And at the end of the video, you can even download the ADS workspace to try it yourself. So now let me show you a quick demo on this valuable Hello everyone. In this demo, I want to show how DOE can pinpoint the component that has caused a wide variation in the output power of this power amplifier, and then show you how to fix it and produce a robust design. This is the picture of the two-stage LTE power amplifier with three matching networks. So if I simulate this initial design, you can see the P-in, P-out curve very smooth and compresses nicely and meets our 26 dBm specification. But when I go ahead and run the Monte Carlo yield analysis with plus or minus 5% variations in the component values, we clearly see there is a wide variation in the output power and there are many failures. So definitely there is a problem in the design that we need to address, to investigate and solve before going into production. To illustrate the power of DOE, here I want to run a DOE experiment on six capacitors, two in the input matching network, two in the interstage matching network, and two capacitors in the output matching network. So on the schematic, I place a DOE controller and the DOE goal, and I select the output power to be my goal. My goal would be P out, output power. I select my six DOE variables, namely the six capacitors, and without going into full detail, because the YouTube video has much more tutorial information for you. Let me run this DOE experiment on these six variables, six capacitors. So here are the trials and here are the results. The results are shown as in a Pareto chart. This Pareto chart tells me automatically that 100% of the problem in my design is coming from C2, the interstage matching network. Capacitor C2 in the middle, in the interstage matching network, is causing my power to fluctuate widely between 27 dBm down to 13 dBm and causing all these failures in my yield analysis. So C2 is really the big problem that is causing the yield issue in my design. So looking at this layout and schematic, here is C2 in the interstage network. It is this series capacitor that is causing the entire problem in our design. And now that I know and pinpointed C2 as the problem, I go ahead and utilize the yield sensitivity histogram template that are available. These templates are available and built in in ADS data display. And notice when I enter C2 interstage, matching network in the template, 
the graph tells me that C2 interstage matching network nominal value is 7.6 picofarad and you can see it changes plus 5% and minus 5%. And notice when it is lower value, my PA overall yield goes up to 100%. But if that capacitor moves a little bit from the nominal to a higher value, the yield of the PA uh, output power goes to zero, which means I am not meeting my output power spec of 26 dBm. So if I lower my C2 value, I should be able to get 100% yield and fix the problem. And this is exactly what I did. I went ahead in the final design here, I changed C2 as shown here from 7.6 picofarad down to 5 picofarad and I re-optimized my circuit. After I did this, let me show you the final yield analysis that I ran. So you can see now my final yield analysis shows very consistent, no big variability anymore. Everything is passing and it is exceeding above the spec 26 dBm. And now I have full confidence to take this design into production and use it. Thank you for watching. Okay. Before I move to the next topic, I thought I'd share with you some real DOE designs with actual foundry wafer probed results. What you see here, I designed two different X-band amplifiers and I have placed them on the same wafer and same reticle. The difference between the two designs are amplifier one used standard design technique and the other one, Amplifier 2, went furthermore and used DOE analysis and improvement, especially the input matching network. And here are the wafer probed results. You can easily see on the right side, the DOE design produced much better and more consistent results and is less sensitive than the standard design. So we got very excited when we saw these results and our Mimic team decided to extend this to a larger upconverter macrocell. Here it is. The X-band amp is now upconverted to 20 GHz with a mixer driven by a 12 GHz LO amp. Now the X-band amplifier and the mixer have utilized the DOE design technique. So we have both standard design and DOE based design on the same reticle and the same wafer. So now look at the foundry wafer probed results on both chips. Again, clearly you can see at the right side that the DOE up conversion gain results at 20 gigahertz is much more consistent and has much less variability. So now you tell me, which macro cell would you select and use in your own 5G system if you need to upconvert to 28 gigahertz? So again, I encourage you to take 12 minutes of your time when you can and watch this DOE YouTube video for much more tutorial information. And you can also download the ADS workspace at the end of the video to start practicing this great and valuable design methodology. Okay, let's now move to another exciting topic, the dynamic impedance between the output of the power amplifier and the antenna with the change in phase in the phase shifter. First, I want to share with you here an excerpt from a technical note by Dr. Neil Tucker. He says that the importance of active impedance should not be underestimated and its effects can be dramatic because it directly impacts the amplitude and phase excitations of the array elements which control the array. So on the right side figure, impedance Z is no longer equal to only V1 divided by I1. Now it is V1 divided by I1 plus E2 over I1 plus E3 over I1 plus E4 over I1, etc. All the E's, E1, E2, E3, etc. are the coupled energy between the array patches. 
So the EM coupling between the patches along with the phase change from the phase shifter dynamically alters the impedance at each port between the PA output and the antenna interface. And I tell you, sometimes this could create what is called a blind spot and dramatically reduce the beam energy, as I will show you next. Let me explain this dynamic impedance to you by starting first with these 50 ohm loads instead of the antenna EM model. So here I'm loading each power amplifier with pure 50 ohm resistive load. And you can see on the right side of the slide all 16 ports impedances are 50 ohms centered on the Smith chart. And the impedance and output power are constant with the phase shifter angle swept from minus 60 to plus 60 degrees. Now, let me expand this by using 16 random resistive loads between 40 and 62 ohms. And again, you can see on the Smith chart the 16 loads scattered on the real axis on the Smith chart. And the power varies now due to the load mismatch. But notice that the power output is still constant as we swept the phase shift between minus 60 degrees to plus 60 degrees. Next, I am representing here the 16 loads as complex loads extracted from the actual S parameters of the antenna at 28 gigahertz. Basically, I used the S to Z function in ADS to get the complex impedance values. But please notice, I am still not including the EM coupling from the patches. I am just using the complex impedance numbers at each patch with no coupling between the patches. And here are the results. You can see the complex impedance numbers on the Smith chart. And you can see the varying power output due to the impedance mismatch. But still, the power is not varying with the change in phase angle between minus 60 and plus 60 degrees. But now, and this is what we are all waiting for, I am including the actual antenna EM simulation results, which includes the impedance and also includes the coupling. Now let's see the results. Wow! Look at that. Look at the dynamic impedance on the Smith chart changing with the phase angle due to the coupling between the patches and look at the output power dynamically changing relative to the phase angle. This is what I wanted you to see and understand what the dynamic impedance is and why it is important and should not be underestimated. And here is a larger view of the impedance change. And this slide shows the dynamic output power change, which shows about a 1 dB variation in output power. Please note that sometimes you could get 3 or 4 dB power variation, and sometimes you could get even higher loss, which would be known as a blind spot. Now, to make this discussion more interesting, let me realistically use PAs with variation in output response which is what happened in real life, variation from one chip to another chip. And yes, look what happens now. The right side plot now shows a total power variation of 3.5 dB. And this brings me back to the design of experiment topic, DOE, and shows that it is very crucial to design your circuits robustly and with minimum amount of variation it will help you produce a much better system with solid and consistent output. Here I'm showing another example using Keysight's Pathwave System Design Tool, also known as System View. It is an 8x8 array system with a full 3D scan. And here's the output results. Notice the variation in output power and the 2.5 dB degradation of power at a certain scanned elevation angle of around 20 degrees, all due to the dynamic impedance. Okay, enough on dynamic impedance. Let's now move to another topic on coupling and isolation. 
Here, I want to illustrate the effect of coupling between the 16 adjacent arms of my transmit chain. You can see I have added various couplers everywhere between the branches to represent the close adjacent coupling and the farther away coupling between the non-adjacent arms. Again, the results here also show drastic degradation in the side lobes and nulls. The side lobes degraded and went up by 2.5 dB, and the nulls degraded and went up from 35 dB down to 19 dB down. And here, with regards to isolation, 5G systems absolutely contain many components that need to be designed with good isolation. Switches, dividers, combiners, couplers, and mixers are among the components that must be designed with great isolation. Here on this page, I illustrate this isolation issue by showing a four-channel switched beam system. I'm using four-arm switch to switch from one antenna to another antenna. So here, instead of a phase shifter to steer the antenna, I'm using a switch to change the antenna direction. So in this case, my switch is on and pointing to antenna number one. And the path to the other antennas are off with good isolation. For a good switch with a good isolation, the left side figure shows that the output power delivered to antenna number one is close to 30 dBm, and the right figure shows the leakage power going to the adjacent antenna number two, and it is minus 3 dBm, which is about 33 dB down from the antenna one radiated power. And this is all because of the good isolation in the switch, better than 30 dB isolation. Now, if my switch is designed with poor isolation and high leakage, as shown here, the leakage power in the adjacent antenna 2 is about 12 dBm. This is high and not acceptable, because that power leakage could easily interfere with another user communicating in that direction of antenna 2. Therefore, it is always best to shoot for best isolation in all your designs. Also, we must run thorough EM simulation to account for the coupling between adjacent components and interconnects and still guarantee the good isolation hold. Now, here's an example of an SP4T pin diode switch shared with me from Plextech RFI Design House in the UK. Final EM simulation shows that both the isolation and the return loss are excellent between 26 and 30 gigahertz. Okay, last but not least, let me now discuss with you the effect of nonlinearities and harmonics on the system, as these harmonics and unwanted mixing products due to nonlinearities could be detrimental. To begin, I show here a transmit chain that utilizes an upconverter to upconvert the input signal to a higher frequency. The mixer here will certainly introduce many mixing products that get amplified further at the output of the nonlinear power amplifiers. Also, I want to point out here and remind you about our previous discussion on design of experiments, DOE. Notice here I am using a similar upconverter macrocell like the one we discussed earlier. And you really want this upconverter macrocell design to be robust with small variation. Here is the radiation pattern of this upconversion phased array system. Look at these mixing products due to nonlinearities of the mixer and the PAs. Many unwanted mixing signals and side lobes are pointing in many directions all over the place, and some with high radiated power levels. And if we display the whole spectrum in a rectangular plot, we see here that the 8 GHz intermodulation product is high enough and violates the maximum requirement of the spectrum emission mask spec. 
So this is great. A quick simulation had pointed out for me this problem, and now I can take action to fix it. And here it is shown how changing the bandwidth of the filter and making it slightly narrower has eliminated the problem and brought the 8 GHz intermod down and in spec. The top part of the page shows the original problem with the wider filter bandwidth and the bottom part shows the narrower filter which fixed the problem. Now here I want to share with you another interesting example on the effect of the PA nonlinearities on the antenna radiation pattern. This new and innovative work is being performed from Baylor University by a PhD candidate, Mr. Pedro Rodriguez Garcia and his team, listed at the bottom of the slide. This transmit chain uses two shared frequency transmit signals from the same aperture a radar signal and a communication signal. So the input signal VIN is written at the top right of this page as a summation of the two shared signals. Now, with the nonlinear power amplifier at the output, the equation for V out is shown at the top right and it contains the third order nonlinear term beta 3 V in cube. This third order nonlinearity causes intermodulation distortion on the antenna radiation pattern coming from the PA. So here, the radiation pattern on the left side is without including any power amplifiers, no PAs. But the radiation pattern at the right side is with the PAs included, and you can see the third order nonlinearities from the PAs cause intermodulation distortion on the antenna pattern, which also takes energy out from the main beams and reduce their radiated power, as indicated in the markers of beam 1 and beam 2. These third-order nonlinear IMDs end up negatively affecting the radar performance as well as the communication security. So the question now is, how do we suppress, how do we eliminate or reduce the, these third-order nonlinearities in order to increase our main signal radiated power and maintain the integrity of our two beams antenna pattern? And here's the solution. First, perform third-order intermodulation distortion load pool simulation and find the minimum IMD3 impedance to present to each amplifier in order to reduce their effects and decrease their levels. So what you see on the left side of this page is the plot of the IMD3 contours, which help us find the minimum IMD3 impedance points. Then a matching network is created and added at the output of the PAs, which transform our PA third order output impedance into these extracted minimum IMD3 impedances, as shown on the Smith charts, at the right side of the page. This method will help reduce the effect of these third order IMD products and help us solve the problem. This work, by the way, is still ongoing as we speak and it is in its final phase. I do acknowledge and thank Mr. Pedro Rodriguez Garcia for working with me on this and sharing his own innovative work. Okay. This takes us to the end of this webinar. There was a lot of information I have shared with you today, and I really hope you found it useful. I started with a discussion and a demo on EM circuit co-simulation and how it is used in the design and analysis of 5G systems. Then I went over six types of analysis on my 5G transmit chain, and I shared with you some uncovered and interesting results that came out from these analysis. To end, I want to point out to you that I have included in the appendix some added material on the design and analysis of every component in that transmit chain I have used here today. It includes the antenna, the PA, the amplifiers, filter, dividers, and phase shifter. 
You see, today's talk is really a continuation on another previous webinar I had given in the past. And that past webinar included the design of the components you saw today. And also it included an example of a phased array transceiver design using SIGI by CMOS technology. Now, I want to thank you again for taking the time to attend this webinar. I hope it was useful to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jack. What a great presentation. Now it's time to the question and answer session. Okay, Jack, here's your first question from Jonathan. In the first demo, you mentioned RF Pro and you used it for EM simulation and far field. Is it a separate tool? Oh, RF Pro is not a separate tool. It's fully integrated with ADS. And yes, in the demo, if you recall, I launched it from the ADS layout page of the antenna to perform the EM analysis and EM circuit co-simulation. You see, RF Pro is, is a new EM environment in ADS for RF and microwave circuit design. And it makes running EM simulation very easy. And that was, that was the whole purpose of creating RF Pro from the beginning. We wanted to make EM setup and EM simulation automatic and very easy for everyone. Uh, give it a try. It is in ADS 2019 and thereafter. Okay, Jack, looks like your next question is from David. He asks, isn't System View also used to simulate phase arrays? How is it different from what you have shown here in ADS? Oh, there are quite differences between the two. Let me explain. You see, System View, which is now, by the way, called Pathwave System Design, is a system level tool that does system level architectural and exploration. It helps you to quickly investigate a whole 5G system, the baseband and RF system together, and determine what is best configuration and component specs. It is a system level simulator. It is fast and it includes behavioral models and it uses X parameter models of real designs and it can also use data from EM simulation. But now, once the system level architecture and specs are defined, ADS is used to design and build the components, the parts inside that system, and integrate them. This design, the design and analysis in ADS, like I showed today, include effects of circuit parasitics, coupling, and other EM effects. Also, if you remember, EM simulation is integrated in ADS, as you saw today, and it co-simulates and accounts for the coupling and EM circuit excitation of the antenna elements. So to summarize, System View is used to design and define the optimum top-level system architecture, and then ADS comes and it is used to design the guts or the components of, the, of that system at the circuit level where coupling, parasitic effects, thermal effects, and other effects are included, just like I showed you today. Hi, right, Jack. Here is your uh, next question from Arthur. Does design of experiments require a separate license to run? And can it be applied on higher level integrations, like on modules or subsystems? Oh, OK. First, DOE does not require a separate license. It is fully included in ADS, and it is part of the statistical tools. Uh, in the YouTube DOE video I have recommended, I do show how to access it in ADS and how it is used. Now, on the second part of your question, the answer is yes. DOE can be applied at any design level, circuit level, module level, subsystem level, system level, etc. You see, I want you to picture you have a box with an input and output. And inside that box could be anything, a circuit with components, a module with ICs, or a whole system with many modules and other things. If you can identify some variables inside that box that could affect the output, then DOE can be used on those variables. So DOE is versatile and can be used at any design level. Great, Jack, and I know that we also added that, um, that how-to video on the resources, that, that link on the resources um, icon, so folks can get it there, so thank you. Okay, Jack, we have so many questions for you, but we're also running out of time, but I know I just want to get this one last question from Erica. So Erica asks, 
The dynamic impedance analysis was very interesting. Did you apply EM and circuit co-simulation on it, or was it just circuit simulation? Oh, great, Erica. Glad to see you found it interesting. Thank you. Now, um, in order to get the impedance and the power at the output of the PA interfacing the antenna, I did use the harmonic balance circuit simulation. What I did is I placed the current probe at the output of the power amplifier to measure the current, and I derived the impedance values with equations in data display. But remember, the antenna has an EM model. It was simulated with RF Pro, and it's always connected to the 16 PAs when I, did the, when I performed the harmonic balance circuit simulation. So harmonic balance simulation was used in order to extract and display the impedance and power at the PA's output nodes interfacing the antenna, which has an EM model. Wow, great, Jack. Thanks for answering that last question. Thank you for attending today's webinar brought to you by Keysight Technologies. Join us next month for the continuation of our engineering education webinar series and enjoy your day.